like to immediately open to you and also obviously to the Twitter participants. So would you like to start? John, what's impressed you about what you've just heard? Um, obviously, we've been listening to, to puzzle pieces um, more than the big picture, but each one of those puzzle pieces has said we have to be part of the big picture that you were also talking about. I was impressed with how many slides you can do in so little time. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty impressive. <laughs> no, I think it's it's clear that that you know from 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 going from from the way we handle the data to the way we're gonna make uh, make electrical cars really usable uh, in a way that 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 many people now are not using or trying to buy a, an electrical car to to solving solving critical issues around parking and then of course looking all of the multimodal type of aspects around it which is probably really going to solve the combination of these issues is a, i think it's a really very nice uh, amount of people uh, put together to, to see what all the issues really are. But before you pass on, um, as I said, these are some puzzle pieces. Which is one critical puzzle piece that you didn't hear about yet in the discussion that we should definitely also be looking at? Uh, we've been talking about this, this legislation, public-private partnerships, right. before. So uh, that I haven't heard, but we just this morning. So no, I think we, we've... Technology is not the issue, I think, at this okay. point in time. It's a lot more. Thanks. Rupert, what has impressed you? Um, one thing I'd pick out was uh, a point that Friedel made, actually, in the first presentation when she referred to the contrast uh, between transport uh, and mobility. Uh, and I think thinking about it differently in that way um, is, is very, very val valuable indeed. And I would go perhaps further to say, um, in English at any rate, that I would also consider the word access. Because transport and even mobility, they're not ends in themselves. What are we trying to do uh, when we move about is we're trying to access goods, services, employment, uh, each other, friends and family. Um, and we do not always need to do this by physical movement. Uh, almost always and increasingly there are, there are other ways of accessing these things. I'm not going to tell you that we're all going to work from home um, in the future. That's been overplayed a number of times. But I think if we think about, if we move from thinking about transport to thinking about mobility and access to goods and each other, I think that is a very helpful sort of conceptual change in, in thinking about um, mobility. Okay, thank you. So what does mobility, is mobility purely a physical concept or is it perhaps something that we can be looking at in different um, modes other than the physical? Let me just, um, first of all, have a listen from Andrea, what people are Twittering about. Okay, well, we've had a lot of interest because we see the innovation that's coming from the side of industry, but there have been questions also about the responsibility of policymakers, kind of what, what role do, does policymakers need to play? So, for example, there's been some discussion about the role for cities uh, to design inclusive policies, um, how there needs to be uh, an architecture involving cars, infrastructure, cameras, and sensors, and all of these require policymakers and industry working together. Mm -hmm. So, maybe talking a little bit more about the role that industry that works in with complementary to um, policy initiatives. Um, there have also been uh, some interesting touching on the end of the car sharing was the fact that uh, intelligent mobility uh, should also be used to increase cycling and walking. You know, what, what are the roles there as well? So if that could be uh, expanded upon a little bit, that would be good. And finally, just um, a final tweet saying that you can't predict the future of transport, but you can build the future of transport. Okay, thanks very much to everyone who's been Twittering. Perhaps we could pick up on the policy, because um, again, John, as you said, it's uh, something that, that is, is overriding everything that we've heard here. Um, we've been talking about incentives, we've been talking about ownership of data, for example, we've been talking about the long-term planning in a short-term policy world. Um, what thoughts or comments do you have that you'd like to pick up on the panel? Where's my microphone? It's disappeared. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, G give us some more, some more flesh on the policy bone. Yes, sir. If you could just briefly say who you are as well, please. Thank you. <laughs> you got two microphones. Thanks. <laughs> it would be stereo. Uh, well, beyond the legislative issues, Consider the organizational issues. I mean, of the smart cities that we know, and there's a lot about discussion, what if the mayor stops the contract with the uh, consultant or with the, yeah? then because this can happen overnight. So, and then everything drops back to zero. 
So there are many issues which are of an organizational issue. Okay, thanks very much. So it's not just a question of getting policy to get on board, it's, it's getting them to stay on board and to have that sort of consistency. Um, let's, let's open it up. Where do you think we need policy to be really having um, an impact or to be supporting, enabling this technology, technology is not an issue, to get off the ground? Kick it off, Anthony. Well, it's interesting. Is that going? Um, it's interesting when you think about the um, you know, Vienna Convention, where um, most countries have signed up to that. Um, interestingly, the United Kingdom hasn't, uh, or didn't. Um, so if you want to have a, an autonomous vehicle or a semi-autonomous vehicle without a human in charge, you can do it in England, but you can't in many other countries. So that's a key change that needs to take place um, to allow um, for vehicles to be driving themselves or parking themselves. So, so why did England not? Why did the UK? Oh, not? it's very complicated and old, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for a number of reasons. But, um, but the other side of the coin, I think, is when you look at a country that has done or put in place a lot right. of um, uh, in incentives, non-fiscal, would be Norway for electric vehicles, where um, you know cheap parking, um, free use of other lanes, um, uh, congestion charge. Um, removal, um, tax, import duties, all those sorts of things, um, as well as you know, as well as the non-fiscals and the growth of the electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid vehicle. I mean, they sell more, um, you know, Tesla and Leaf, um, Tesla S and the um, Nissan Leaf are the highest-selling vehicles across the board, not just in um, sustainable vehicles, because it's just a, it's it, they. The vehicles become a better proposition because now you can drive all the way into the centre of the city in Oslo and park, for example. So I think the, the government has a lot of tools at its disposal which it can use quite quickly to encourage this mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, what about the use of data, for example? Oh, I just wanted to say something about legislation. Yeah. Uh, legislation and technology are things that do not fit together. Legislation is most of the time very... Uh, fuzzy fuzzy and technology is very accurate. Uh, legislation takes a long time to be in place and technology evolves very fast so we need to look for other ways to get us organized um, and I think cooperation is a much better way to, to do that. Sorry for... So not, what, not waiting for legislation yeah. because we're going to be, it, the technology is not going to be azure yeah. by yeah, that time. Uh, now, now uh, Rupert, and then um, I'll come to John and ask, ask how you can be so sure, for example, as a company that the city of Hamburg is going to, um, the mayor is not going to just simply say, oh, I don't want to work together anymore. But Rupert, what do you think? Yeah, I just, I mean, part of what we need here is, is getting the basics right, which some countries do do and others don't. I was hearing with some envy uh, from Aunt about um, uh, integration with the, uh, with the Swiss public transit uh, network. Um, you know, that's, that's great. Switzerland is generally a, a legend in terms of how uh, it integrates public transit. Um, by contrast, in the UK, outside of London, we have an almost willfully disintegrated uh, transport system with deregulated buses and, um, you know, railways that, that don't own the, you know, the different owners between the tracks and the running stock, etc. So, um, we've got it. Whereas in London, it works very well because it is still integrated. Um, so, some of those, some of those sort of um, ideological errors are things that we need to uh, to get right in the countries that haven't got them right at the moment so that we can get it as good as the countries that have got it right. How, how easily is that reversible? Um, that, is, that is clearly um, political and ideological. It requires a debate over whether what we've got is working um, now. I think you will find most people in, who work in transport or mobility in the UK will acknowledge that what I just described doesn't work outside of the UK. However, it has not made it through the political debate and you know that it's it's going to take an election or two at least possibly more before we can fix something like that because it's all really very hard coded into the financial system through ownership of companies etc okay so um and if perhaps i could just ask what, what what are the key success factors in the swiss example well, in Switzerland, might actually be a bit special in the, in the, in the terms that it's always uh, seen a continuous investment, a continuous support of public transport. And uh, unlike you mentioned, actually, I, I have to give some great kudos to what TfL is actually doing in London right now. But uh, the fact is, as you mentioned, that the infrastructure in London has for decades seen virtually no investment, and they are still kind of catching catching up with this, which kind of uh, is, a, is, a, is a tough thing to do if you have to do this with under 24-7 operation. Um, I, I think, but uh, what's uh, coming back to the social factors. I believe that the technology being around, what we very often miss 
uh, is a holistic view in approaching these things. It's something that integrates the economic needs, the social needs, the desires of society, participatory processes, and all those things that are downstream from there. And I think that Switzerland traditionally probably, uh, uh, due to its history and due to its, uh, its special political system, maybe is a little uh, uh, more adaptive on these things uh, and, and, and thus can, uh, because everything is, is, is submitted to a, to, a, to a popular vote, so uh, basically there's a, there's a big consensus uh, on, on investing in public transportation and in making it better, which does not say that there, there aren't any hiccups. There are, of course, and I mean, there are big challenges for the future in terms of maintenance of infrastructure and those things, but we try at least to maintain a holistic picture that gets all the stakeholders involved, and this is what I observe sometimes that might be missing or a, a little bit elsewhere. Okay, thanks. Now let's go um, to the to the gentleman's point on um, that was made about reliability of public-private partnerships. How can we ensure that it's? Well, I mean, you, this is investment that we're talking about. Yeah, I I I, I think you said it very well, Arndt. Uh, the combination of economic, social, and environmental sustainability are three common factors, which actually. Uh, make up the drive for a mayor want to lead these things and to be re-elected. Let's, let's be clear about this. The way he's going to be re-elected is the way he's going to show that he made a difference. And that is not just by putting in new technology, but that is also by making sure that the entire circle is round, that it makes it greener, he, uh, he makes it uh, capable for growth, and of course, he makes sure that it's affordable. And it's all those things combined which makes up your business case before you start out on this journey. And if you don't have the business case, you don't start out. It's very, very clear. So it's not about trying to move a box or trying to sell uh, a database or, or, or a router or a switch. It's about making sure that the end effect is fully calculated, that you are accountable for what you're doing, and that you, of course, can show the results because the mayor takes a risk. He takes a risk in saying, I'm going to solve, for example, the traffic or mobility problem for the next five to ten years. If you take that risk, you want to make sure that you have something to back yourself upon. So you, you don't do that just like that. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is that with all the, it typically is a, is a great uh, combination of a number of, of great uh, partners in a, in a, in a combination of, of, uh, of a social and, and, a, and economical and a, and a, and a, and a, and a sustainable plan to make sure that what you want to do is really uh, doable and affordable. And that's how these uh, leaders actually put themselves behind that. OK, so it's about um, taking the risk, but also having a vision and being very clear about what you want to achieve in the next five to 10 years. Um, but obviously, the, the companies are also taking a risk. So um, can you explain a little bit more about how that risk is shared when, for example, you're setting up um, innovative charging systems, intelligent charging systems, or parking systems, or open data? How, how, how is that risk shared in that public-private partnership? Do you want to, Friedel? Public-private partnership is already, uh, when the t business takes off, I think it starts already with research. Uh, so um, uh, in our company, uh, research is absolutely looking for cooperation because uh, you need to consider a business case, an end-to-end -end, uh, solution, and you will need to work together with other partners. Uh, so that's something that uh, has changed in the time where previously researchers were doing research and then... Uh, and afterwards, there was maybe an opportunity to sell it. Now they work together on a very concrete uh, mm. problem with, of course, the visionaries, the early adopters. <coughs> and once it is uh, common, then uh, you start to roll out. So we work uh, very often in pilot environments with European Commission projects uh, where we meet other uh, partners and, uh, and share and try to connect to their, other th their technology to build one solution for the user. So, so your partnership is going to start before you even know, know what product you're going to be selling at the end. It doesn't start with a product. <laughs> it right. starts with a problem and then yep. uh, it evolves to a solution. Okay, so it's a completely different role of um, policy, but also of business. It's no longer the, sale, the salesman meets the buyer. It's um, much more a partnership before that starts. Yeah, absolutely. How do you, how do you share that risk with policy, um, yeah, with I mean, governments? From our perspective, um, you know, risk is money. You know, it's, uh, so if we invest in a new technology or, um, you know, a new development program, then um, it would be unwise for us not to try and, um, you know, ease the way um, for that technology to ultimately end up in the hands of a consumer who's going to pay for it. 
Um, and I think um, you know, Fred will touch on it, the way that um, legislators and, and governments, whether they be central or local, can share that risk is to put some money up front. And I think um, you know, there are plenty of projects and programs around where um, you know, government money is um, made available. Um, I think it's, in some respects, it's not always so straightforward as just putting cash up because, you know, from, from our perspective, we're a very um, IP-based company, so we develop intellectual property and then we licence it, um, you know, horizontally across the supply chain. Often, um, the uh, projects that governments are supporting will have um, sort of odd IP rules in them where the IP becomes shared. So that then you know, becomes difficult for us to play in that situation. So, so there's still a lot of stuff to work through. You know, it's not as plain as just, you know, hey, let's all hang together and come up with a cool idea because you know, there is a serious business and you know, as um, you know, executives and companies, we are um, you know, burdened with the responsibility of um, increasing the value of our company to our shareholders. So it's, um, you know, it's a very, very clean line um, in that direction and very messy on the other side. So takes time and, uh, and thought. Okay, thanks. Just before I come back to, to you um, for, for further questions and comments, Eugene, now you're a startup, so um, where do you think the role of policy of government with that framework, um, what's the role to encourage the innovations that we haven't actually thought of yet to come into being to create the mobility that we need in the urban space? So, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, of course, you are interested in uh, so what Friedel was talking about in terms of open data. Of course, uh, the vast majority of open data is produced is, is by local governments. Um, and from that perspective, of course, it's very beneficial to us to be able to access the data that exists, but perhaps is locked in and is not available to third parties like ourselves. So from the perspective of open data, uh, we're very interested in, in, in participating in that. And we've, uh, at least in the UK, uh, national uh, government has highlighted Parkipedia as one of the examples of, of successful companies that, that use open data and use this as an example of what can happen when such data is made publicly available to, for, for public benefit. Um, on the other hand, of course, when it comes to, uh, to, to, to regulation and so on, and again, I think Friedel mentioned that is uh, technology and, and, and legislation move at very different speeds, and in that, in that respect, yeah, we would rather to have government get out of the way um, and, and let the companies proceed. So, so it is, is a double-edged sword. On one hand, you, you, you need it and you want the, co uh, the, the cooperation. On the other hand, uh, you just want to get out of the way. So. Okay, thanks very much. So, so policy, um, we've heard on the one hand it's about, it's about in providing incentives and we've also heard they don't need to be fiscal incentives, they can be other incentives to make it, to make it sexy. I mean, if we look back to the example of the bus, and um, we're still looking at buses also not being accepted, but um, if we see car sharing, it's, it's become much, much more acceptable. So the incentives of, being, of using something other than the, just the individual car, then the provision of the open data, um, without being too descriptive and prescriptive, and the long-term vision and commitment um, that uh, policymakers will need to adopt, particularly mayors, for example, um, also in joint risk-taking and joint investments. Now, what else would you like to add to the discussion? Do we have this lady over here, and then yes, and hello. Um, uh, your I name, hope please. My, my name is Louise, and I'm, I represent the consumers uh, in a. A car owners association and uh, I hope my question is within the framework and I'm asking to the Swiss gentleman because uh, <laughs> with the car sharing I think that uh, it's very exciting but um, I also see that uh, even though it's a growing market that um, that our members may be a little bit um, reluctant to to be car sharers and uh, my question is, uh, uh, how did you persuade the consumers? And do you know who your customers are? Were they car owners or were they bike riders? Or who are your customers? Or were they these young people that aren't in interested in the car anyway? Uh, so yet. Are they yes. converts <laughs> or are they new yes. people? Well, actually, the customer, the customer profile of car sharers uh, is quite similar in large parts of the of, of the Western world. Uh, it's academics. It's rather young people and older people. It's people who do not uh, who value the social prestige. If they value social prestige and in in, in, in in having something in, in possessing something in ownership, not not access but ownership, then it's rather an iPad or an iPhone uh, than a car. And uh, it's this. It's it's a rather 
not narrow, but it's 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 a well-defined typology uh, of people who classically and still today make up the majority of car sharers. And we also know that uh, if these people come from two car households, uh, the very vast majority of them will get rid of at least one car. And uh, those that join the scheme from, uh, from a one car household, uh, they almost all of them get rid of their car after some time. Uh, if the conditions, again, uh, if transit access is good and if the conditions are such that car sharing uh, uh, is a viable alternative uh, whenever you need a car. And uh, th now this, this focus group that we had traditionally is opening up and because people talk about it as in the press, it's getting fancy and uh, of course that helps targeting customer segments that we hadn't before, but also there are things like a luxury market uh, that, that has not been tapped yet. And I mean, for example, Daimler is trying that we also introduce the luxury segment or, or, or a segment with a little better cars a couple of years ago and that starts to work out very well. So this shows that car sharing opens up to new markets. Okay, now this is interesting. You, just stay with you a minute, Aunt. You said that people are surprising themselves by then getting rid of the second car, but they didn't actually go into this knowing that they would get rid of the second car. So there's been a mind shift. Well, if I had a job to do and kids to bring to school, I, I, I would first join the car scaring and then look if it works out to get rid of the car and not the other way around, probably. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very understandable that people are uh, a bit on the, on the, on the defensive, on, on, on the cautious side if they join the scheme. But what, what is really nice is that uh, in many cases it works out that way, and in the not, in, not only in many cases, but in the vast majority, actually. I'm talking about the target group um, and listening to your answer. Is this a very middle class? Yes, it's a um, academic, academic, rather young families, ac academic middle class thing. Actually, when people have, for example, two kids again, then some of them actually sometimes buy one car again because of the logistics of getting kids around is something that is so complex uh, that uh, that uh, this is difficult to handle. Also, we had we had a d discussion going on for the past 15 years of how to get kids on, on car seats inside the cars, and this ended up with us uh, pro proposing um, um, rucksacks that can, can be fixed with the Isofix fixations that you can take along as a rucksack, and then you can put it in the car, and it's legally, it's a, it's a, it's a seat on which you can put your, your, your child. So you own your own thing, you bring your own thing, which is important for hygienic regions. Uh, regions. Now, unfortunately, the Chinese manufacturer of these things went out of business, and we're back on the on the on the first field. So we need to we need to start the discussion all over again. So it is a, sometimes it's the little things that make it challenging, uh, but I think solutions can be found. Okay, thank you. Now I know John, you have to leave in five minutes. So perhaps if I could put you on hold just um, to see if anyone has a question or comment specifically to John, please feel free. Otherwise, I do actually, John, because just thinking about the target group, um, the middle class, the academic, these are people who are thinking about the bigger picture. Perhaps they're also aware, like the mayor we were talking about, of the importance of a long term vision, the economics, the ecology, the social side. Is this going to be a mass phenomenon, this connectivity? Oh, I, I don't think you can stop the connectivity uh, evolution. I, I mean, it's not me who's going to decide that, it's the people. But if you look at the way people uh, work, live, play and learn today, I, I think it's very clear that connectivity is their major driver. Now remember, it's also those people who create, uh, who has turned our economy into an app economy. And this app economy is driving a lot of new innovations uh, as such, 15,000 apps per week are actually being built by, by those type of people. So they will, gonna, they will keep on innovating, I believe, using that type of approach and that mentality. So I don't know if they're gonna, they're gonna be able to do other things and evolve other things than car sharing uh, in that sense, but I, I, I truly believe that, that they will drive a lot more innovation and a lot faster innovation uh, than we've, we've ever seen before. And this innovation that can also be accessed by others than just the middle class academics. Yeah, and, and I, I, I hope that, that like, like Friedel said, the availability of open data and keeping, trying to keep it free, because that's going to be the big, that's going to be the big play, and that's going to be whoever owns the data is going to rule uh, a lot of the things moving forward. You can see that in a number of companies around the world who, who are being looked at that. Uh, if you can keep it free or as free as possible, uh, then I think a lot of innovation will, will keep on taking place using those type of app type of approaches, I think. Okay, thank you. Anything. Thanks, John. Let's give him a round of applause.
Rupert, what's your feeling on the target groups? If you could um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add to what John said. I mean, I, I agree entirely. I think it's the same in the UK with uh, with car sharing that um, your your early adopters are from middle class groupings. But the other group I would point out uh, is is the is the youth market is the young because these are the people who uh, are less likely to have driving licences than they used to be uh, because they find cars more expensive, uh, insurance more expensive, and because they are more interested in using their mobile devices and they are accustomed to using them. So I think there are two sort of seed spots or growth spots. Uh, there's the middle class in the case of car sharing, uh, but, in, but in terms of the wider change in behaviour, and in particular uh, paying less attention to, to owning cars, uh, that, is, that is the young. And we have seen in the UK, I think it's something like a 20% a fall or thereabouts in the number of young people um, who have driving licences. And, you know, that is an enormous change. Um, and this, this naturally, as these people get older, potentially that approach percolates through the population. OK. Um, what about Parkopedia? Um, will, will this be a, a, um, a, a service that is going to be used by a great mass of people or is it the lady going to her meeting who's got the big car well we sure hope it's going to be used by a great mass of the of the people so i mean our business faces both the consumer as well as the uh the b2b business which is our automotive licensing business mm -hmm. so i think uh the vision for us is to both to enable the this plumbing essentially um, that will be required for autonomous cars, and that, of course, is, is where we will work directly with the automotive industry, as, as we are already doing today. But as I already mentioned, actually, our Parkopedia today is, is largest dedicated parking service, and there are literally millions of people every, uh, every month who use us on a worldwide basis. So through both through our website, through our uh, apps and so on, and to go back to the mobile domain, so uh, actually uh, I think this, this well, probably next month will be the first month ever in our history where more users will use our services from a mobile device than from a, from a desktop. Wow. Uh, so this trend has been ongoing, of course, for a long time. If you look at the general internet traffic breakdown between desktop and mobile, it either mobile either already overtaken or <clears throat> is due to do so in the next uh, in the next few years. Is already seventy percent. Yeah, so it has already happened, I guess, a few years back, and I can see that in our own data, where obviously from you know from a few years back, and we started two thousand seven, which is when of course the iPhone was released, where there was no concept of mobile or very very simple. To uh, about like I said, of next month or, or this year, when we have more users on mobile devices than we do now on a desktop. So, so we're looking so at really reducing the hurdle, reducing the threshold. It's a big shift. Mm, okay, thank you. Did you want to comment on that, Aunt? Yeah, I wanted to say that actually we need to be uh, aware of the fact that the probably biggest innovation in transportation in the past decade has been the smartphone. Okay. I mean, uh, the, the fact that people are giving us and they finance it themselves, we don't have to kind of convince them in getting those data terminals. They get them themselves. So we have the opportunity to kind of get data to them and that's, that's really, I mean, that's like a gift. Okay. Just picking up or carrying on your point before I come to, to the gentleman at the front and then the gentleman there. Just um, we've been talking about target groups. And again, it's very much in this sense of we have users. Now, what I picked up from you, Friedel, was that you're also considering target groups to be um, developers. So using citizens participatorily to feed um, into the development of systems that are in themselves um, incomplete. Development is something, but also data. Okay. Yeah. Also data and um, um, I pick up what you said that um, uh, having this social media is, uh, has, is becoming very important uh, because uh, sometimes information from the big institutions will not be necessary anymore because we communicate to each other what's the next uh, stop uh, time from a bus is on a certain <coughs> bus stop. So uh, the end user is very b important and he has be become more... Um, strength prominent uh, um, in, in the whole process. I wonder if that's going to lead to better results. I mean, it was interesting looking at the beautiful <laughs> image of the suburban countryside that we used to think was wonderful, and now for some reason we would say we don't. So. Um, uh, Does it mean the result was wrong because we didn't involve people in the it, beginning? It, we, we, will, we will evolve like that because uh, our mobility is very much impacted by incidents today. And these incidents, the information comes from institutions but also comes from the social media. Right. Uh, so, uh, and we, we want to react because the traffic today is so... W w 
the smallest incident creates enormous traffic jams. So okay. we need to react fast. Uh, and we need to use all of these points of entry that we have. Now, is the gentleman um, here at the front? Do you have a microphone, sir? Um, then I'm going to... Do you mind if I take this? Sir, do you, you pose your question or your comment, oh, and sure. then I'll come straight to the front. Uh, it's also a question, it's more of a remark. Um, my name is Vladimir Vatayev. I work for a Dutch company, which does enterprise mobility for transport and logistics. So I come from a technology background. But uh, what I hear in this conversation is the absence of two really important perspectives, which I think will change the mobility in the coming years. The first perspective is actually talking to architects and urban planners. And um, I saw your example of the OD self parking, and I think it's an interesting technological example, but um, in the long scale, it's absolutely useless. It's just a luxury problem to be solved, and uh, this car can start driving on its own and just moving around the city, but what is the purpose of that? And uh, I was showing the slides of the urban sprawl, and uh, who designed those cities? Well, those cities were designed specifically because transport defined those cities. They were designed because we thought that uh, oil was absolutely limitless, we have no cars, we can move around, and then the mall dominated the landscape. And that's the, the typical modernist scenario that you see in many countries, specifically the United States. It's different in Europe over here. But there are so many solutions which um, are not necessarily, they're not stupid, they're still intelligent, but they're not necessarily related to technology. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Europe, uh, there are more bans on how you park and how you use the cars in the cities. Uh, there are concepts of walkable cities, so let's build and design the city from the point of walking that you can access, as you correctly point out, almost everything without having to rely on a car. And in that, in that sense, I think uh, Parkipedia, your, your example, is a bit of solving a very specific luxury problem, right? It's interesting to pay less for, for parking because no one likes to pay for parking and no one likes to pay, for, uh, pay taxes. But getting in the car and seeing where is the cheapest parking, I think is already too late because what you would like to see in the beginning is really a fully multimodal solution. Does it really make sense to use the car? Or can I get there without using the car? Can I use the bike? And that brings me to the point that this technology that we're talking about, it still is there to enable better personal solutions. But we know that if we don't change the behavior, the total gridlock is almost inevitable. And in order to avoid that gridlock, more solutions that take into account everyone else should be made. So I'll be looking more at the solutions, what choice as a consumer, as a person moving, I can make that fits my goals, but at the same time is actually beneficial for everyone else. And that's the fundamental change of behavior when taking transportation. So when going, to, going somewhere, I'd like to see, okay, what is my emission profile? Maybe I care about that. What is my cost? What are other options? Mm -hmm. And I think that when we make our own choices, these are individual selfish choices, and it's really difficult to make them rational for the benefit of the overall system. Okay. And I don't see the contradiction over there. And that's the kind of technology that I think we should be coming up more and more with. Thank you. So really this behavior changing technology and also the form follows function, not technology for the technology's sake. Let me just... Um, yeah, I also well, related to my question as well. Uh, what's your name? Uh, I'm Peter Bitsok from, from TNE. Uh, basically, I actually wanted to a bit argue because I want to see two, two ideas. One of them won't be actually too popular. One is that parking is very, very cheap. Like we heard from John, that 30% of traffic is looking for parking. It's very cheap. I looked into a study uh, basically in Chelsea uh, on, a, on a license, uh, what's called a leasehold property, is now cost £2,000 per square foot whereas a residential uh, parking spot is two pounds per square foot. That is per year. Mm -hmm. So if we increase the price of parking, then of course, I hope now we're gonna uh, reach a debate as well, then car sharing could be you know, induced more. Uh, I wonder how municipalities should actually value parking for car share car, uh, companies, which are basically reducing the need for parking. So, and that, that's the reason why I would actually even say that Car sharing is a way of public transport. It's a type of public transport, and, uh, and municipalities should actually subsidize the same way as any other public transport company. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Eugene, what would you like to, uh, to say? To, to address the first gentleman, um, unfortunately, I only had 10 minutes for the presentation, so I had to remove some slides from my presentation, and I removed the slide which you would love to see, <laughs> and that's the slide is multimodal. Um, on phase, Two, which is kind of what's happening in the medium term future, where I was talking about payments and everything else coming in. There was another slide that I unfortunately didn't have time to cover, and that is multimodal transportation. Uh, if uh, I had an example of a BMW multimodal routing um, engine, and essentially it is exactly what you said you get in the car and you say, I'm going from my house and I'm going to my destination. The car is connected, 
The car knows where you are, and the car now knows where you're going. The car then presents you with a list of options. Those options driving from point A to point B. Those options are driving from point A to a train station, taking a train or a bus or whatever it is. So the car actually, uh, some of the, I don't know if that technology is already live, but it certainly works. Um, the car that gives you those exactly those options, as you mentioned. And parking there is, is, is still an enabler. It's an enabler where you need to drop it off at your final destination, or it's an enabler where you need to park it, drop it off at the train station and then hop on a train. And the multimodal routing action is pretty smart because, of course, it knows all of the information. It's connected. It knows if there's a space available at the train station. So perhaps if there's, a train sta if there's a space available at this train station, it will guide you to the next one. Not because it's closer, but because there isn't parking available at this one. The car will also give you a pricing option. The car knows the train times, and the car knows how much it actually costs. So it can give you an option. If you drive from point A to point B, the cost of driving the petrol, uh, maybe the congestion charges in London plus parking will be this, but if you take a train, it will be that. So you have all of the options, and then you can make the intelligent decision, which I think is what you're referring to. So, so, so you might think that Audi uh, parking is, is, is silly and whatever, but, but um, those options as multimodal are actually, if not the reality, will be the reality, starting, of course, from the luxury segment and then uh, coming down to, to everyone. So that's already happening. And that's what also came up in the Twitter, was what about bicycles, what about foot? Is that all, are those also options that you can access? I, I think, uh, I don't know if, so again, uh, now I regret deleting the slide, uh, but you see, you know, on the, on the graphic on, on the slide, you know, you can see kind of this, your, your train, not train, right, so your journey being split into different segments. You know, this first segment is, is, is driving, the second segment, let's say, is a train, the third segment is, is walking. Um, and and I, so I, I think what we might also see is the connection between, let's say, the navigation system in the car, perhaps, and then the mobile app, where the mobile app does the last pedestrian routing and perhaps also will guide you back, back to where your car via the train and, and whatever else. So, okay, so, so, so not technology for technology's sake, but in order to enable you to take the right decision. Correct. Rupert. Um, yeah, just to add on the, the subject of uh, bike and walking, uh, this sort of comes back to getting the basics right, because while in some places the basic cycling infrastructure is great, Copenhagen, Amsterdam being outstanding examples, in other places uh, it isn't. Um, and I, so I think there are some other barriers to get over mm -hmm. before we're at the point where technology can be helping people to choose uh, walking or cycling. Um, and there's an enormous debate, you know, almost a tribal debate in, in the UK and in London in particular at the moment over sort of cycling versus driving and will we shift a whole amount of road space over to cycling. Uh, from Transport for London's point of view, it's probably the only way we can fit people down the street. Um, but so that's just to make the point that you have to get some of those, some of those basics and that's, a, that's an infrastructure point right so that people feel safe before they are, mm -hmm. are going to be ready, even if you've made it easy through the technology uh, you need to get that right before they're going to be ready to actually make that choice. And it sounds like not just an infrastructural decision, but also an ideological one, because we're suddenly creating all this yes-no position against position. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you ha as a, as a uh, society, you have to make, make that decision, um, and you, you have factions within that, you know, those who are saying, no, I want the roads for my vans or my car, uh, versus the ones saying no. So do we have the right people in the discussion? Do we have the right stakeholders taking those decisions? Uh, I think I think we do, uh, and I think it's a. Uh, and I'm referring to to the London situation specifically at the moment. Um, uh, the debate is at a high profile, and it's it's well stuck in. It's a little bit polarised. There isn't quite the sense of we're all in this together, which there should be, because uh, there is, there's kind of mode competition uh, in the debate as well. You've got different societies, cycling groups, motorist groups, um, but we need to remember that this is, if, if you are in a city community, that the person who gets on, the, if, if I'm driving a car and somebody else is riding a bike, they're not in a car. If they weren't in the bike, they might be in a car and they'll be delaying me. So everybody is actually helping everybody else in that way and we need to recognize that sort of spirit of collaboration. Okay, and that's where this, this behavior where I'm thinking of myself but I'm also thinking of the broader community um, seems to also play a role, aren't? I also, I also want to make two quick points on, on what has just been said. I entirely agree that that uh, it's about it's not about a car or not a car. It's about providing the best personal mobility solution for your need in a specific situation at a specific time. And thus, I think that however, wherever these systems converge to, uh, integrating solutions on the built environment plus technological solutions, the gradient needs to be towards something that is at the same time ecological, 
economical, sustainable, and filling your needs, and if possible, even somehow stylish or whatever you might want to consider that. And these solutions that come out of that optic and that fulfill all those needs, and that are not artificially to be held up by some governance or policy inputs, that is the solutions that are going to win and that are ultimately going to, me, uh, to make the race. And saying that I, I totally believe, I'm, if, if I'm being a bit radical, I, I even believe that cars, uh, a, a car in a, in, a, in a city center, uh, it, w w it doesn't belong there. What does it have to do there unless you have to, some heavy cargo to carry around or something? Basically, it shouldn't even be there. I mean, kids could play in the streets, families could kind of breathe. I mean, d d the urban space is much too valuable to waste it and uh, to, to with, 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 with having sitting cars just sitting there and, 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 and waiting for the next use. And this brings us to the age of autonomous vehicles. Once this is there, I believe that the parking issue will reduce to the sense that these vehicles, that they will, they will be publicly held or privately held whatever but they will come you will order one with an app it's going to be there two minutes it's wait two minutes it's going to pick you up mm -hmm. or it's not going to pick you up then it's going to pick the next customer with the centralized dispatch that's automating that and these vehicles are going to be on the road they are going to be stored on the road like airplanes for airlines that are going to be in the air mm -hmm. and the time when they're on the ground has to be minimized you know the, 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 and, and this is I want to see these cars working and not standing around somewhere well, if they, they could might be charging while they're standing around, right, yeah, Anthony? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I was just going to add to that because I think um, you know the the autonomous parking, semi-automatic parking, or semi-autonomous driving. So it's just um, these pilots are to show that there is the um, technical capability to do it. I'm not suggesting that you know the the future is us just getting out of our car and the car going and parking and we're still having the same number of cars and i think if you look at some of the numbers you know the reduction in the requirement of cars if you use car share is you know pretty compelling i think there's around about 72% of um vehicles are sitting most of the time not driving so you know there's an immediate sort of four times gain if you um, have each vehicle just constantly working, much like a plane does. And then, of course, you're sweating that asset, which is the vehicle. The other thing is there's something in the order of two-thirds of roading infrastructure is parking. So, you know, if you, take, if you move to a, a situation in future where it, the, the vehicles are not owned and it's sort of last in, first out on a, on a parking situation and you get swarming, you can have vehicles, ultra-urban vehicles, which are then going into a park to charge and get off the road uh, whilst they're not being used, and you do have to refuel them, so you know you've got to accept that. Um, and but they're going into a corner of a room like this. You know, you could get, you know, if you look at some of the um, concepts for vehicles, which are you know two people side by side, for example, they might have a square meter of footprint. You know, you could get 20 of them in this room pretty easily. If you tried to get a car in here and park it, you'd probably get four or five of them in. So <laughs> I think these if, are... If it was me parking, it would be much less. <laughs> yeah, so, so these are just illustrations of, you know, proving the technology out so that we can then fold it in. And, then, and it's a little bit like the app world. You know, once you see what technology is available and you put it in the hands of, of users and, and, and you start getting a socialisation element of it, um, people will start coming up with all sorts of ways we haven't thought of to, to use it and exploit it. Okay, thank you. I'd like to, before we close, definitely come back to the to the question of acceptance, because if we put it into the hands of users who, in brackets, want to use it, and I've not heard enough, I think, about the, the, this anti, and I'm wondering if you're very confident about the anti-use of data or the anti-use of, um, or the anti-change attitude that we're seeing in a lot of our societies, the banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere nor any time, whether that's going to also affect your success. Um, but perhaps you have questions or comments on that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Antonio Russo. I'm a consultant here in Brussels. So question for uh, Parkpedia. Very basic question. So starting from the video you just showed us. So the lady, she presses a button, she leaves, and the car does everything alone. Let's just assume that the, you know, that the technology fails for, you know, for a short instant and the car um, runs over somebody, I don't know, an old lady. So who's liable for that? Thank you. Okay. Thank I you. don't think you know. I, I don't think it's a question that I can address, considering the car is being built by Audi, not by Parkipedia. But just to say, yeah, those issues are, are still open, and you know, I think this was refer alluded to to to, to earlier. I mean, I certainly, it's not a parking question, right? It's an autonomous car, and who takes the liability? So, 
Uh, it's a big question. I think the answer has been defined. I'm certainly not well positioned to give you a good answer for that. So, okay, sorry. and it's definitely going to be one of the issues that affects us, um, acceptance. It's a much, much bigger question, right? So, And this is where, again, going back to roles of government and so on, I mean, it's a good question, right? Who do you blame, right? Do you blame, <laughs> the, do you blame your Apple for, for, having, for having this app and so on? Do you blame the, the Audi, right? Or, or do you blame someone else down the line? And no one, no one quite knows, but I think the good thing is that what we know today and the, the Volvo presenter was absolutely correct. The vast majority of crashes and deaths happen because of human error. And yes, I'm sure there will be some unfortunate accidents where there will be the first, you know, there is, I can't remember the name, but there is the, the, the name of the person that died, the first person ever die in a car crash, right? The name is now in history, and there will be another name, the first ever person to die in an autonomous car. What hopefully won't be is, you know, just thousands, thousands of deaths that will never be in the history books because they've been removed. So, so okay. my point is that I don't know, I cannot answer your question, but the point is, I think the, the, the autonomous uh, technology uh, will make the, our, our lives and cars far safer than they've ever been in the past. That is for sure. Thank you. So it's about risk sharing, but the risks should be lower. Yes, sir. Well, actually, I had the same question, but uh, I will uh, put another one. Uh, what is the, uh, the status of, because um, in order to, to adapt for the end user, uh, safety goes first. Um, what is uh, the status for the um, 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 for, for when you go to an insurance? Uh, are you insured, um, and is there already a legislation about it? Okay, so again, it comes back to the liability question: who whose fault and who who stands there for any problems? That yeah, and and another question is uh, part of it is uh, we're living in a connected global world, but what happens when it uh, um, when uh, when there is an uh, uh, an issue? Uh, in a city, um, I mean, by in, in Rotterdam, uh, there is other legislation and other uh, security uh, uh, um, uh, issues than in, uh, I mean, in China. So again, it comes back to the question of collaboration. How can we ensure that these very complex collaborations that we're, we're entering into um, with technologies from all over the world, with users from all over the world, how can we be sure that we have the same understanding of the, of the legal, the insurance, and all the other frameworks? Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, some of the um, questions that are raised, uh, because we're looking at the transport system as a, as a single system, where we've got trucks, bicycles, motorbikes, cars, all traveling at different speeds on the same road. Um, you know, if we start to segment this out slightly and not to go away from uh, multimodal, but if you think of an ultra urban environment where you've got smaller vehicles which aren't traveling as fast, they're sharing the road a lot more with um, uh, cyclists and pedestrians, etc., uh, and they're not built so that if they hit um, a truck or a brick wall at 30 miles an hour, they don't um, uh, crumple um, because they're not traveling that fast. Um, then, and I think the statistics in London are quite um, interesting. In the, the turn of the century, not the one gone, but the one before, the average speed across London was nine miles an hour um, for, for the average journey. And now it's 7.5. So you don't actually need to be travelling at 50 miles an hour through a city to get where you want to go faster. You know? So you start taking the vehicles off. You know, you've got these vehicles which are now picking up a lot of people and dropping them off and going to the next person and picking them up. You need way less vehicles. Um, they're travelling a little bit slower. Um, they're hyper-connected, so they're using LiDAR, radar, cameras. Um, the people have got... Um, I mean, we've done some work. The other part of Qualcomm, as you probably know, is the 3G, 4G, 5G. Um, network provider um, and uh, uh, communications company. And we do a lot of work with car companies and, and the connected vehicle. And a lot of the work we've been doing with Honda, for example, is in having a, an early warning system which everybody has a smartphone, and I think you've, you've based the uh, assumption there. Um, the person is carrying a smartphone, the car connects up, and we've got certain um, prototypes already in um, test where the vehicle can come along, it can see, inverted commas, a person walking along, and the two... Um, systems then communicate which, with each other. So the, there's an alert on the um, uh, handset of the user if they've got headphones in, it's an audible <coughs> alert. Um, and same thing on the car, it uh, comes up on the um, user interface, it says pedestrian and, mm -hmm. and vicinity. So both um, the pedestrian and the car are now aware of each other and they can start to take a bit more care. And I think those sorts of things, um, you know, backing up um, warnings for within car parks, 
um, uh, which already exists to a certain extent, but you can add that connectivity to them mm -hmm. and then have per people being alerted, you know, the, the phone squeals at them or, or whatever, and that okay. will reduce. Thank you. What's on the Twitter wall? What sort of things are we well, missing? I'd say um, it, after um, they, the, we addressed the policy issues, uh, now people have picked up kind of the consumer side of things, where um, if there's uh, what needs to happen to make intelligent uh, vehicle technology widely available, infrastructure investment, but consumer uptake as well. So what can we do to encourage uh, consumers to um, mm -hmm. request these technologies, to want to use these technologies, to understand these technologies? Um, and also the matter of affordability, but also data protection at the same time. So all of these kind of consumer-facing issues mm -hmm. as these uh, technologies come. Thanks, Andrea. Let's pick up on that. I mean, are people biting at the bit really excited about using this, Anne? Maybe because it's, it's, it's coming up again and again, maybe this question of, 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 of privacy and of data protection, it is a big issue, especially in Europe. Um, we need to be conscious of the fact that historically privacy is a concept of the bourgeois age. It's less than 200 years old. It didn't exist before. And even if I'm sorry to, I, I'm, just say, I'm, I'm just finding that, I'm not judging it. But as of today, it, did, it does not exist any longer in the way it existed 10 or 15 years ago. That's a, that's a fact. It's not something uh, you can find it good. You, 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 you might like it, you might dislike it, but that's, that's, that's the fact it is today. And I think we need to, we need to acknowledge this and, of course, have a, social, have a social discussion over the consequences that this might possibly have that might arise from that. But I think we need to acknowledge the fact and, 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 and really spark off uh, a, a new debate on the use and, as was said before, on the property and the management of data. So look at the opportunities, but being aware of the risks rather than ignoring that it's out there. Who else would like, um, how can we make sure already and in the future that consumers are on board? Yeah, well, I mean, I think fundamentally technology has to be better. Um, and you can't expect people to buy stuff which is worse than the product they're replacing <laughs> it with. So, you know, um, so the journey has to be um, safer, uh, it's got to be cleaner, it's got to be cheaper. Um, and I, I disagree with the idea that we're all going to go back and just wear leather out because I think you know we do need to move around and we've got to move bigger distances as cities get bigger um, and we've got to move safely out of the inclement weather, all those sorts of things. Um, and I mean, I, when I came here this morning, I um, toyed with the idea of walking from, you know, it was 45 minutes walk and when I stepped outside and it was raining, and I went, ah, okay. So, you know, I hailed a cab, and it was, you know, it's those sort of things you've got to accept, don't you? That, um, you know, traveling at night, um, maybe it's not so safe, you know. So, when we get to this nirvana, when everybody's in love with everybody else, and it's, uh, everything's green, and there's butterflies everywhere, maybe we can walk. But uh, until then, I think we'll need some form of, um, you know, mobility, which is inside a vehicle. Okay, so we need to be tolerant of people's needs rather than saying they should be um, functioning the way that, that our technology is telling them to, Rupert? Uh, sorry, I was just going to add to, uh, to what Anthony said there. Um, so I, I had the same dilemma getting here this morning with the rain, etc. And what did I see coming down the street but an electric cab? So <laughs> I, I hailed it. I, in fact, I turned down the, the petrol vehicle that was going to stop first and went for the BYD cab to get here. So the future is here too. Well, I think I can top places. you all because I chose my hotel to be 300 metres from this... Um, venue so that I could walk. Ha. <laughs> okay, let's go into a final round. And um, we've been talking a lot about collaboration and the need to not only collaborate once we're using in a multimodal way, but also in a development way. Um, and I'm just going to put to the panelists sitting here if there's one person on the panel that you would most like to collaborate with or where you see the need to collaborate with um, in order to really create a new milestone on the way to an improved mobility for smart cities. Who would that be and why? And you have about a minute each. <laughs> Do you want to start, Rupert? Yes, please. And if they're not sitting on here, you can fill the seat yes. that's empty with someone else. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so on the panel, well, there's sort of two things that occur to me. Um, we're already working, at Forum for the Future, already working on a, um, a multi-mode um, system. I think there was a question about it in the, in the earlier session, one to get the full uh, bus, rail, car sharing and taxi all on the one screen. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that right now. Um, so certainly I'd be interested in talking to aunt, aunt as to the kind of... Um, uh, the, the kind of um, integration with public transit that they're um, achieving in Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> and my second one is kind of a suggestion for collaboration here. Because um, I was thinking when uh, Eugene was 
um, saying, well, you know, we, maybe we don't need the uh, the parking lot. The, la the lady's car and the Audi can can just go back home or whatever. What I was hoping he was going to say at that point is you don't need the you don't need the parking lot because actually she's just got out of her car. Somebody else can use it instead. Oh, you know, okay. and that's peer to peer car sharing. Now, I accept that maybe the lady in the hundred thousand dollar Audi might might not be into that, but you know, many other people um, you know, may be able to do that. So perhaps that's the other variety of parking where parking becomes comes car sharing. So just an idea Thank to you. throw out for collaboration. Let's take someone from the other the other table. Who would you like to collaborate with? I, I need a lot of partners to work together, so I can do something with everybody here around the table. Um, I would need uh, connectivity in order to um, do origin destination analysis because there begins the as is and the problem analysis of mobility. Um, the parking is, uh, is of course, a destination, so um, I uh, very much like the idea of having a mobile phone where you also can pay your uh, mobility, not only for parking, but also for public transport. Um, and I think the biggest challenge is public transport, working together, and uh, the real-time information is the most critical one, it's uh, difficult to get uh, and it's essential to do a real-time, uh, yeah, on-the-spot mm -hmm. adjustment of your mobility. It's raining, you need a cap, where's the cap, and so on. So uh, it was very interesting. Thank you. What about you, Aunt? Well, uh, actually, and I'm not, I'm not saying this because I don't want to, t to take a position, but I'd like a round table here, and I'd like also to discuss with the two people that are missing here. And this is one person from the transit industry and one person uh, from the cargo logistics. Because, as again, as I made the point before, it's all about sharing that same space. And that delivery van that has to unload shares the same urban space that you need for parking, that you need for driving, that you might, do, you might need the same curbside to hail a cab, that you might, ha you might need the same curbside for a bus stop. So... How is it all? We need more roundtables. We need more integration of the different stakeholders to talk to each other and to, to use these fantastic technological um, possibilities that we have today actually for the first time in history. We're living in an age where for the first time the development of technology is faster than the, than the governance and the policy maker, the, the, the policy making that is actually now uh, r largely reduced to a, to a reactive mode. This is something which w w for which there are very few historical examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we all definitely need to sit there together and, and, and attack this. I mean, I was in this Intelligent Transportation Systems Congress in Detroit in September and uh, some people even said that some some car hire private hire services like Uber and Lyft will eventually totally replace transit. That's not going to happen. There's a, a space constraint in there. So mm -hmm. we need to sit together and leave our small field and open up the view. That's what we need. Thank you, Anthony. I'm going to use the empty chair um, that you that you opened. Um, <clears throat> and you know, Einstein had this famous uh, comment that if he had an hour to save the world, he would use the first 59 minutes to define the problem. And I think that's really, um, you know, my statement is that, you know, if we're trying to um, put a, a mobility, uh, connected mobility uh, infrastructure and um, system in place for 2050, we need to know what that 2050 looks like. So we need, you know, all of the various stakeholders sitting around um, surmising what that may look like, you know, what the population looks like, what the movement's required, um, what our cities look like, et cetera, um, before we can actually develop the, the uh, technologies and the solutions to fit that that need. So that's where I'd be looking to collaborate. Okay, thank you. And Eugene? Um, yes, yeah, so I think there are, I already alluded uh, during my presentation, I think there are two areas that were, there were the two talks before before me that were relevant to, to Parkopedia, certainly in terms of open data, what Frida was talking about at IBM is, is, is an obvious one, but also what John was talking about in terms of smart city, the connectivity and enabling those, uh, he mentioned the parking sensors and so on from, from smart city's perspective, and that's certainly something that you know, our business le lives on, right? So you can say data is the blood of, of today's Parkopedia's business, so, so be it, again, open data generated or, or private uh, public partnerships is, is case with Cisco, um, those are the enablers for our business. Thank you very much. There's a great need for collaboration, but also a great um, uh, willingness to collaborate. Um, and this, this need is certainly recognized um, by our stakeholders here on the panel. And also, I think, by, um, from your questions, by you also in the audience. Thank you so much. Let's um, please join me in thanking our panelists.